Thanks for watching this video from Cherry Hills Church. During this series, we want to spend time with Jesus to learn from Jesus how to live the way of Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. And if you don't have a Bible and you want to use one of the black ones that's in the seat rack in front of you, you can take that out and turn to page 814. Mark 3, 20 through 35. And this morning, while you're turning to those pages there, I've asked my friend Tony Williams to read the scripture for us. And Tony and his wife Jan started coming several years ago. They lived in Jacksonville for years and moved over to Springfield. And we are just so thankful. You may recognize Tony sometimes if you're watching the choir. And uh, Tony's favorite thing to say to me is, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so... Would you listen along as Tony reads our text for today as we continue in our series? Then Jesus entered a house, and again crowds gathered so that the disciples weren't even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is, a, is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided... He cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter the strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven they are guilty of an internal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brother arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers, he said. Then he looked at the seated, those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Tony, appreciate it. So we're in a series called The Way of Jesus. And as we continue, uh, just a reminder, we've been saying we want to spend time with Jesus to learn from Jesus the way of Jesus. And by the way of Jesus, we mean his way of life, his way of approaching life. And so as we study that together, I've entitled this message today, Tension. Because we're going to see that immediately in this passage, there's ongoing tension that Jesus has been facing for the last couple chapters, and it continues in this one. And I want to talk to the, uh, to, with you today about tension. What is it? What causes it? And what can we do about it? What is it? What causes it? And what can we do about it? So if you're following along in the notes, notice right away after Tony just read this, that Jesus faces tension with his family and the religious teachers. Jesus faces tension in this passage with his family, his own family, and the religious teachers. And as you're thinking about that, here's what I want you to notice in this passage. I want you to notice Jesus' way. How do, what, what is Jesus' way in this passage? How does he handle this? Notice Jesus' way as Mark sandwiches these tense encounters, if you're following along. Sandwiches these tense encounters. Now, this is uh, something, I'll just give you a picture up here on the screen. Uh, I think we've got one. Have you ever seen this before? This is a, a plain hamburger. And this is a sandwich of sorts. And you'll notice that in a similar way, what Mark is doing is he's using a literary device. In fact, he's going to do it 
uh, several more times in chapters uh, 5, 6, 11. He's going to do it twice in chapter 14. But it's this device where you take one story and you wrap it with another story around it. What do I mean? If you look up here, you'll see kind of uh, what we see of this sandwich. If we're going to see verse, uh, in verse, 21, verse 21, we'll see Jesus and his family as mentioned. They come to take charge of him. Then we're going to see all of a sudden that now Jesus is talking to the religious teachers. And there's something going on there. And then the passage comes back, wrapping around with his family again. So notice this, because at first it seems like these stories are unrelated. But we're going to see that they actually both talk about a kind of tension. So as we think about this together, if you're following along in the notes, I want you to notice that there are two kinds of tension that we notice when he wraps these two accounts together. And uh, let me just give you a definition. I told you I was going to talk about what is tension. I was looking this up this week. Tension is a state of worry or nervousness, uh, inner striving and unrest or imbalance, stress. Can anybody relate to tension? In fact, I'll just say this real quick. I, was, I went to the post office this week, and uh, I noticed a lady that was really in tension because she'd just gotten out of her car. She had her cane, and the wind was blowing super strong. And as I walked past her, I said, pretty strong winds, huh? And she says, yeah, I just got my hair done. She goes, what was the point of that? <laughs> and I could tell she was feeling tense about what just happened with all the wind. But tension can be something like that. But also, we know this, it can be a state of unfriendliness or opposition. And that's what we're noticing here. And so whenever you and I start to notice a tension, there's something about that. And in this story, what I want you to see is that there's two kinds of tension mentioned. First, with his family. If you're following along, uh, his family thinks he's crazy. His family thinks, Jesus' family thinks he's crazy and comes to take charge of him. This is a fascinating way to talk about it. It literally means they came to arrest him. They came to seize him. They came to control him. Why are they so threatened by what's going on? It says that Jesus was so uh, was becoming so sought out that he didn't even have time to eat. And uh, we, all we can deduce is that possibly they were embarrassed of how he was doing something to the family name. Or that there was something about him that they just thought, this guy's talking bigger. He's, he's, he's representing himself in a way that people are going to start thinking he's nuts. Then they're going to think we're nuts. But I want you to notice that, again, they don't do this because they despise him so much. They actually think they know better than he does. But they still come to stop him. Now, that's one kind of tension. Here's the second kind of tension if you're following along. The religious teachers think he's possessed, and they come to discredit him. They think he's possessed. The word for Beelzebul there is just another word for Satan or the devil. So they're basically saying, the devil's got a hold of him. That's the reason why he's been able to cast out all these demons. That's why he's been able to do these miracles. It's because the devil is controlling him. And we are told in the end times that Satan will try and trick people with miracles and things like that. So that's possible. But that's what they're saying. They're saying he's possessed. And that their kind of tension, the reason they're threatened, is because now the power structure, their comfort, has been upset. And they do not like the way he is upsetting their, their recognition in the community, the way that his teaching seems to be catching on more than theirs. And they do despise him. In fact, we saw a few weeks ago when Pastor Steve was teaching, they want to kill him eventually. That's how bad they want to stop him. Now that's tension. So Jesus has already been experiencing tension with people just by being Jesus and doing what God wants him to do. And that tension is so big. And so it, if we understand what tension is, then the next thing I want you to see if you're following along in the notes is what's causing both groups to be in tension with Jesus? What, what, what is it? Why do, they, why do they feel like it's their duty to stop him? Why are they threatened? Why, why is something just by him being who he is, why does it work them up? And again, I want to answer that in just a few moments, but uh, years ago, I heard 
Andy Sorry. Stanley used this, this phrase, these quotes. I'll put them on the screen. He says, pay attention to the tension. Or is there a tension that deserves my attention? Whenever you start finding yourself tense with Jesus, pay attention to that. And there are times that I have been in tension with Jesus myself. And so what's causing that? Let's think about that some more. So let's talk about the way of Jesus. How does he handle it? So if you're following along, in both cases, Jesus responds by asking a question. So with both parts of the sandwich there, you'll notice that he asked a question. With his family, he asked a question. And with the teachers, the religious teachers, he asked a question. In fact, I've listed them there in that first gray box. Would you mind reading them out loud with me? I know I'm doing that right after I just gave you things to fill in the notes. So can we still do that together without me throwing you off? Here we go. Let's read them together. How can Satan drive out Satan? That's the question he asked first to the religious teachers. And then he comes back around, and here's the question he asked uh, when his family comes to take charge of him. Let's read that. Who are my mother and my brothers? Now, this is a fascinating thing. I told you a few years ago that Jesus, if you take all of the times that Jesus asked questions, either himself personally or through the characters in his parables and stories, over 300 times Jesus asked questions in the Gospels. After I, I found that out, I, I was reading through the Gospels each, uh, all year. And each time I went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I put a cue next to every question that I saw Jesus ask. And there are two of them here. We just read them. This was very rabbinic uh, in his style to ask a question, to leave with a question. But here's what I want to say. It's also a brilliant way to live now. We live in a telling culture, not an asking culture. But if you and I learn how to ask questions like this, we will oftentimes be able to dig deeper. What is Jesus doing? He's uncovering, he's revealing their hearts. He's helping them see what's actually in their hearts. So he just says to the religious teachers, can I just ask a question? How can Satan drive out Satan? And then he goes on to say, look, a kingdom divided against itself, a house divided against itself, and you know, Satan divided against himself, every time they won't be able to stand. They're, they're, it, it just makes no sense. Now, many of us have heard a house divided against itself cannot stand from who? Abraham Lincoln. He knew the scripture and he used it in his speeches because he understood that this is the truth. People divided against themselves cannot ultimately be established. And so he's just simply saying, if that's the case, and by the way, in one of the other gospels in this, in this uh, parallel account, he says, and if I drive out demons by Satan, who do you drive demons out by? So he digs even deeper. But notice that, that asking questions is a powerful way that Jesus approaches this. He doesn't yell, he doesn't scream, he just says, can I ask you a question? Notice too that Jesus, if you're following along, teaches first things first in their proper order. Jesus teaches first things first in their proper order. Now, I told you that I want to talk about what is tension, what causes it, and what do we do about it. When we think about what causes it, I want to show you a quote uh, of something that I think is really important. And here's what I believe Jesus is getting at with them, because he's trying to help them see that something is disordered in their life. And that's what's causing the tension. Whenever things are out of order, it creates a tension. So look at what this quote by Jeff Warren, what he says. He says, in his classic work, Confessions, Augustine explains that sin is disordered love. It is love out of order. We often think of sin in terms of behavior, bad deeds, actions, but Augustine helps us from another angle. There is an order to love. He said we should love God, love others, then love ourselves. The problem comes when you love something you should love, but that you should not love supremely. That's when a good thing becomes a God thing. There's only one first. This disordered love, this idolatry is not easily discerned. Alfred Adler noted that it's very hard to figure out what you're really living for simply by asking yourself. 
He says, you're not, all that, you're not that self-aware. You may think, I'm living for God. But the way you find out is to look at your nightmare. What thing, if absent, would almost or would take away your reasons to live? He says, your deepest emotions, anxiety, fear, despair, will point you to your God. What's really in first place in your heart. What's going on is is that because Jesus is teaching and acting the way he is, these people are tense with him because they have something that's before God in their heart. And whenever you and I put anything before God in our heart, it will produce a certain, we will have to live with a tension that we were never meant to live with. Jesus said this, look at what he says. This is a hard saying in Luke 14, but look at what he says. Anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, or sisters. Yes, more than his own life. Otherwise, he cannot be my disciple. So no one can become my disciple unless he first sits down and counts his blessings and then renounces them all for me. Unless he first, first. Jesus teaches first things first. Years ago, some of you are wondering why I'm wearing this crazy sweater today. Years ago, I saw an illustration that I've never forgotten, and it helped me. And uh, an older man said, let me just take my cardigan sweater here and show you what happens. He says, if you take the third button and you put it in the first buttonhole, uh, the sweater just will not look right. And uh, I, I would really not like to walk around like this the rest of the day. And what happens is, he says, only, only if you start with the first button hole and the first button, will it begin to have order. And Jesus is saying here, look, because you don't have first things first in your heart right now, you are in tension with me. Therefore, What's, what's the cause of it? Disordered love. Disordered love. Sin is not only trying to be independent of God, but it's trying to say, I want this ahead of you. It could be a number of things. It could be good things. It could be good, good things that God's given us. But if we put them before God, life will never, ever work out the way we want it to. And this is not easy to do. This, this, this actually makes us upset sometimes because we say, I'd like to be the first person in human history that proves it otherwise. It just won't happen. We're, we'll find ourselves kicking against the goads, as he once said to Saul. So if you're following along, notice that he declares really good news with a warning. He declares really good news with a warning. Uh, I was on the train to Chicago to go see Greg and Vicki Syverson with Chad Reeser, and, and we were, we were studying, I was studying, and he was studying, but I was studying this passage, and all of a sudden I thought, wow, in the middle of this really hard saying, Jesus offers incredibly good news. In fact, it's found in that second gray box. Would you mind reading that out loud with me? Verse 27. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up then he can plunder the strong man's house. Now, here's what I think Jesus is saying. And then he goes on, if you're following along, in verse uh, 28, he says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. If you're, if you're following along in the notes, notice that he, he declares really good news with a warning here. And I want to make sure that the good news is more important to you than the warning, but the warning tends to stand out to people because it's called the unforgivable sin. So I want to address that in just a moment. But here's what I want you to see is the really good news. Jesus is saying in many ways to the teachers, the religious teachers, do you know who you are talking with right now? There's only one way I was able to cast out those demons. And that is, if I'm stronger than the strong man. Hallelujah. The reason why he was setting people free 
is because he was able to tie up the strong man. Friends, the strong man is no match for Jesus. They are not co-equal. No match for the strong man. I can tie him up and I can plunder his goods. I can offer good things to people. I can take away his power. You know what this means? This means that if Jesus Christ comes into your life and mine, that it doesn't mean that we won't sin. It means we don't have to anymore. It means when the evil one comes at us and tempts us, we may, we may still fail, we may still fall, but we don't have to. We don't have to give in. We don't have to sin. Now, because he can live inside of us, because he can rule our lives, he's stronger than the strong man. But here's some other good news for those of you that right now are so overwhelmed because the evil one has his foot on the small of your back and has been saying to you as the accuser often does, how could you ever call yourself a Christian and still commit that sin you just did? Anybody need to hear good news about that? Every sin, he says, every person that's ever sinned, their sins can be forgiven, every one including that big one that's in your mind right now that you don't think he can forgive because you're still so shocked and so amazed that you did what you thought you wouldn't do. That can be forgiven. He says, but, but I also need to warn you. And friends, let me just say this. Love warns too. Love says, you know, you're, 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 you're bumping right up against serious danger here by telling me and telling others that what I just did by casting out this demon was because of an impure spirit. You are attributing to the Holy Spirit an impure. You're saying that the Holy Spirit is demonic. Be careful. Now, let me just explain this. First of all, let me just say this. Some people will come up to me and say, what's the unforgivable sin? And here's the unforgivable sin. It's not murder. It's not any kind of you can name. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin. Okay, And Jesus is saying is, what you're doing right now is you are bumping up against that. You are speaking against the Holy Spirit who is working in me. Okay, Now, listen to what Chuck Swindoll writes. I found this very helpful. Blasphemy can be described as defiant irreverence. One speaks blasphemy when denigrating another or seeking to do damage to the subject's reputation. This would include insolent language directed against God attributing uh, the, the teachers of the law were attributing the acts of the Holy Spirit to the work of Satan. If this blasphemy is ever acknowledged as sin, it can be forgiven. Sin becomes unpardonable when the guilty one rejects the path that leads to pardon, continues in rebellion, and refuses to bow in submission before God. Therefore, a person receiving the penalty of the unpardonable sin has condemned himself This sin is a chronically rebellious and continuing, persisting attitude, not a single act. The teachers of the law condemned themselves in this way because even after Jesus conclusively disproved their allegation, they were saying he has an unclean spirit. The imperfect tense here indicates continuing action against all reason. They persisted in their blasphemy. And Jesus is saying, be careful. You still have time to change your mind. You still have time to cry out to me, the one that's stronger than the strong man. You still have time to have even that sin forgiven. But if you persist, that will turn into the unforgivable sin. I love how the message paraphrase shares Matthew's parallel of this in Matthew 12. Look what it says. Here's what Jesus says in the message paraphrase. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you deliberately persist in your slanders against God's spirit, you're repudiating the very one who forgives. If you reject the son of man out of misunderstanding, out of some misunderstanding, the Holy Spirit can forgive you. But when you reject the Holy Spirit, You're sawing off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity, all connection with the one who forgives. Does this make sense? Friends, the Holy Spirit is able to speak to your heart and mind right now. Jesus said the Holy Spirit comes to convict, to convince, and to lead us to Christ. 
Therefore, if we reject his overtures, if we reject his gracious reaching out to us and we persist in that and we continue to say, I am against him, then that becomes dangerous and it can lead ultimately to the eternal sin. Let me just say one more thing. If you're worried about whether or not you've ever committed this sin, you probably haven't. If it bothers you, but if it doesn't bother you, now I would urge you to take Jesus' warning very seriously. Friends, the Holy Spirit, even this morning, is reaching out to every one of us and saying, trust me, return to me, don't push me away, don't try and do things your own way. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. Now notice that he, he, not after that, here is the way of Jesus. It's to love God first by doing his will. It's to love God first by doing his will. Would you read that uh, verse in the third gray box with me? Here's what Jesus says when people tell him his family's outside. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, let me uh, just share with you what, what Kent Hughes says about this, because some people have said, what is he saying? Is he, is he basically saying his family doesn't matter to him? No, that's not what he's saying. Here's what Kent Hughes writes. This is one of Jesus' hard sayings. What did Jesus mean by a shocking answer? First, he did not mean that he was severing family ties. In the final hours of his life, while he hung in agony on the cross, he thought of his mother and made provision for her. Later, his brother James would become a devoted father in the church and a martyr. Jesus held parenthood in the highest regard and castigated those who failed to give honor to their parents, as in the disgraceful use of Kurban in Mark 7. Jesus was not suggesting the breaking of family ties, though he did acknowledge that Christian commitment would sometimes bring division within the family. What he did mean was that there was a deeper kinship than flesh and blood, a spiritual kinship which is characterized by obedience to the Heavenly Father. Obedience does not originate the relationship with God. With faith does that, but obedience is a sign of it. Jesus was saying that there is a new family which is far superior to the human family, for it is eternal. It tie, its ties are far stronger. It is far more satisfying. It is far more demanding. Those who are in his spiritual family are far more dear to him than his human family with whom he lived for 30 years. What Jesus said here has massive importance. So Jesus is saying, look, first things first. Love God first and do his this is what I came to do. I love the verses in Hebrews that he says, you've given me a body. Behold, I have come to do your will. And so as we think about this, think, of, think with me just some examples. First of all, think about how he wrestled in the garden. Mark 14. Look at what he says in Mark 14. These, this is such a powerful thing. I've listed it out to the right. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. This is the night before he's going to be crucified. He knows what's coming. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, which is the Aramaic for daddy. Abba, father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Wow, I'm so glad he went first. And he paved the way. That when he lives in me, he can pray that prayer in me. But notice what he also taught when his disciples came to him. They said, teach us how to pray. He said, here's how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he talks about praying for daily bread, then praying about temptation, those things. But first things first, if you don't want God's will, then why in the world would you pray for other things? So, but remember what he also says in Matthew 6, 33. I think we've got that verse on the screen as well. Would you mind reading it with me, please? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And so notice that disordered loves, the disordered loves of our heart, the best way for God to order them is for him to be first. And eventually, Jesus would say this warning in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Look at what he says. 
Knowing the correct password, again, the message paraphrase, knowing the correct password saying, master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, master, we preach the message. We bash the demons. Our God sponsored projects and had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. And that's pretty colloquial right there. But what is he saying? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do my will. You want to know the way of Jesus? It's radical obedience to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And so there's this challenge here that he wants us to see that when he comes into our lives by faith, when we trust in him, there is this responsibility, this response that he's looking for that makes us right with him. And we want him to be first in our lives. So let me just share with you a little bit about this in my own life. My dad had this habit when he would preach when I was growing up as a kid. And he would finish almost every one of his sermons this way. It, no matter what he was teaching on, he'd finish by this way he'd go. Now, now that we've read the word of God, will you yield your lives to God in this area? And I hated that question because I had so many things I wanted to do with my life. I had so many plans. I wanted to keep my options open and I did not necessarily want to yield my life. And I remember there were times in these old wooden pews that I would just grab the back of that while we'd be singing the closing song because there was tension in me because I didn't necessarily want God to be first. Can you relate to that? I wish I could tell you that that went away, but it didn't go away. And one of the things as the years went on is that eventually, I've told this many times before, but I eventually started dating a girl who wasn't a Christian at the time. We weren't at the same place. We were unequally yoked spiritually. um, But I was going to lead her to Christ, you know. I was going to help her be Christian so then it'd be okay because I wanted my own way. And I suddenly felt like it was me and her against the world. My parents weren't happy about it. The youth leaders weren't happy about it. I knew God wasn't happy about it. And so there was a man, there was a family friend of ours who I always wanted to avoid because he would ask me in those days, how are things going with the Lord? And I I, I said to my parents, I hate when he asked me that question. Why? Disordered loves. So I I just would avoid him. But one time he, he, he cornered me. And uh, we, were, we were sitting out on a grass in Wisconsin, and he said to me, he said, Jeff, have you ever been able to get to the point where you, you could say to God, God, I don't believe I can live without her? Question. I said, no, I've never, I've never told God that. He said, if you're willing, I suggest you tell God that. I'll never forget when I finally said, God, I don't think I could live without her. And God showed me I could. And God showed me that if I would put him in first place, that I would be able to love every other person and every other thing in my life in their proper order. But if I didn't love him first, I would never be able to love my family best. I would never be able to love other things and other people the same way. But if I would love him first and let him have first place, now I would be free to do that. So if you're following along, how do we practice Jesus' way? I've put here just basically a prayer. Heavenly Father, is there anything I'm loving more than you? Years ago, I started watching a movie, and I wouldn't say this is the greatest acting I've ever seen in my life, but the movie got me, and it's called Fireproof. It's about marriage. And it's about a couple that was incredible tension with each other. They were always fighting. And part of it was because the husband did not, did not really love the Lord first. Really, both of them in many ways. 
And what happened is, is that each day he would be on his computer. He was interested in buying a boat and saving money. And so that was his money and his boat. And then he also watched porn. And so when his wife would come in, she'd say, you know, if you, that's what you want to be about, go ahead. But if you think I'm going to be responsive to you, forget it, okay? As God began to work in his life, one day she came home and she saw the computer that had been on the desk bashed in in the garbage can. And she got to the desk and she saw a rose, 12 roses in a vase with this note. I love you more. I love that scene because I think that's what we really are thinking about when we wrestle with rightly ordered, disordered loves. This morning, I got up really early, and as I was exercising, I was looking at the pictures of our three kids and our grandkids, and I thought, man, I love my family, love my wife, but if I'm not careful, I can lose my first love, Jesus. So I found myself just saying, Okay, God, show me how not to put them up here. Show me how to put them in their proper order. Because you'll help me love them better if I give myself first to you. Show me, Lord. So I want to just put a list on the screen. I don't know what it might be for you. It might be family for you. It might be a person, a relationship. It might be a possession. It might be money. It could be a position. It could be your job. It could be a plan. Is it security? Is it comfort? Or is it family? Would you just take a few moments? This is how we're going to prayer, prepare for communion. This is the opportunity. The Bible says when you come to communion, examine yourselves. Just see where your heart's at. Because every one of us, if we're not careful, can easily get away from God being first. It's such a daily thing. But what does it look like today? Is there anything standing in the way of you doing God's will and making him first in your life? Thanks for joining us today. If you'd like more information, visit cherryhillsfamily.org or find us on Facebook.